So I want to start by talking about these recent earthquakes we've been having. What I'm showing you here is the rate of earthquakes that have been happening in, in, in this part of the central US since modern, size, modern earthquake recording in the 1970s. And then what you'll very distinctly notice is if we add in the earthquakes that have happened more, more recently, we have a runaway earthquake occurrence going on. Um, the, these earthquakes, earthquakes naturally happen throughout um, tectonic plates, both at the edges and in the middle, but at differing rates. And, um, and, and as you can see, something is happening that's causing us to run away from this natural rate of occurrence more recently. Um, so what I've done here is, is we're, we're zooming in on the last 20 years and, and we're looking, plotting all of the magnitude three or larger earthquakes in the US through time. And the point I want to make here is that if we could solve the, the Oklahoma earthquake problem, we would have gone from having this many earthquakes to having that many earthquakes. Okay, so the, the, we can account for, for this uh, deviation from the trend by, by other induced and triggered events around the central and eastern US, but the lion's share of the extra earthquakes we're happening are in Oklahoma. And I, and I want to tell you about um, what we're seeing. And to, to drive that point home here, I've juxtaposed the uh, number of earthquakes in California with the number of earthquakes in Oklahoma here. Um, this is work by Art Magar at the USGS. And as you can see, um, there's, there are natural rates of earthquakes both in California and in Oklahoma. The, rate, the natural rate of earthquakes in Oklahoma is a lot less because it's in the middle of a tectonic plate, not at the edge of one. Um, but all the, um, as of very recently, we're seeing more earthquakes in Oklahoma than in California. We can look at those earthquakes on a map. There are all the red dots here. Here's the map, this map of the state of Oklahoma. I've cut off the panhandle. And as you can see, we have these kind of clusters of earthquakes in, um, the, in north central Oklahoma that we'll be talking about in more depth today. Um, we can look at those earthquakes just in Oklahoma through time. And again, as you've seen before, this is the number of earthquakes um, in, in the state of Oklahoma. So now I want to lay out what's happening, right? There's, we know there's energy production in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I'm sorry, the slide is cut off at the top there. But the, um, what we have is, I mean, you all know about hydraulic fracturing. That's when we drill a uh, horizontal well into a shale formation. Um, when you hydraulic fracture, you pump a number of millions of gallons of water down that well, and you produce small earthquakes. So we're talking several thousand earthquakes of magnitude minus two to minus four. A magnitude minus two earthquake releases the same amount of energy as a gallon of milk falling off a kitchen counter. Um, so it's a, th these are very small earthquakes that, that routinely happen during hydraulic fracturing, and that's not what we're talking about today. Um, there have been, in the maybe million or so frac jobs that we've done in the US in the last 10 years or so, there have been a, a half dozen or so cases where this hydraulic fracturing stimulation has happened near an active fault. And in that case, there, there, we do have document, in those documented cases, hydraulic fracturing has triggered slip on an already active fault. Um, and again, that, is, that has been documented in Oklahoma, but that's not the phenomenon that we're talking about today that can account for this runaway in the number of earthquakes. Um, what can account for it is these wells we call saltwater disposal wells. And what they are is they're, they're disposing of industrially produced water, often from oil and gas. And they, they, they dis, they're in Oklahoma, they're di disposing of it into a, a rock formation, a sandstone called the Arbuckle Formation. Um, and there are over 100,000 of these saltwater disposal wells operating in the US, and the vast majority of them are completely safe. However, once in a while, sometimes these saltwater disposal wells are sited in an area where they're near an active basement fault. When that happens, the, the well can increase pressure in the subsurface by injecting at a high rate, and that pressure can propagate down the fault. 
Um, the faults are naturally experiencing tectonic stresses or tectonic forces. Um, and what happens when you pressurize a fault is you act, you act to unclamp it. In other words, the fluid pressure fights against these yellow arrows, but the fluid pressure doesn't change the orange arrows. So the fault wanted to slip some, but it was squeezed closed, and we just unclamped it and allowed it to slip in an earthquake. Um, and so what we're seeing in Oklahoma is these basement faults slipping in earthquakes of varying sizes and, and nuisance and hazard related shaking associated with this fault slip. So it's not that cracks are opening up or anything like that um, at the surface. The, the issue is, is, is the number of earthquakes shaking the earth and causing earthquake hazard to people. No, ca or causing earthquake hazard. Also in Oklahoma, um, there's another kind of well that, like the saltwater disposal wells, is also regulated, and that's enhanced oil recovery injection wells. So the difference between these two is in one case, you have an old oil field that's maybe several dozens of years old, and it's producing both oil and water at the surface. Now they can make money by skimming off the oil and then they have to dispose of the water and so they can pump it down an enhanced oil recovery injection well or down a saltwater disposal well. And there are two important distinctions here between these two kinds of wells. The first is the depth or the formation that they're injecting into. The saltwater disposal wells are generally injecting into deeper formations in Oklahoma. Um, the other distinction is that in the case of the enhanced oil recovery, we have fluid flowing in a circle. Uh, it's, a, it's a cyclical flow, um, whereas with the salt water disposal, you're not producing anything from this formation, you're just pumping water into it. And it's easy to imagine that if we're worried about pressurization, that it's easier to, to pressurize when you're not producing anything from it. So let's talk about um, the, the, both of these kinds of wells are regulated by the state, and so we can look at their volumes. What I've plotted here in black is the total volume injected by those enhanced oil recovery wells. So those are the wells um, th that are re-injecting into formations that, they're, that are produce, being also producing oil. Um, in brown, I've plotted the volume from saltwater disposal wells through time in the entire state of Oklahoma. Now, in between, in tan here, we have some wells where, from the regulator, we don't know which kind of well they are. In other words, we know that volume was injected, but we don't know if it was from this kind of well or from this kind of well. Um, I've also shown you on this slide the number of earthquakes as red dots through time as a function of magnitude. So what you can see is over a period of uh, approximately 20 years or so, we have an approximate doubling in the rate of injection um, in the entire state of Oklahoma, with the, the majority of that injection coming from an increase in saltwater disposal wells and a, and a slight increase or a relatively constant amount of injection in enhanced oil recovery wells. So let's go back to the map and see where these earthquakes are and see where these wells are. Um, the brown dots are saltwater disposal wells and the black dots are enhanced oil recovery wells. Um, you can also see historical earthquakes um, as, as yellow dots and recent earthquakes as red dots. So the historic, when I look at this, I see that the historical earthquakes are broadly distributed and the recent earthquakes are in these several clusters. And so what we've done is we've picked out some clusters here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare areas such as this area here we'll call Cherokee um, with lots of earthquakes to an adjacent area without very many earthquakes. Um, so we, f let's cut to the chase, though, and first look at the areas with all the earthquakes or with most of the earthquakes. So that's Cherokee. Perry, and Jones. These three areas encompass about 72% of Oklahoma's recent earthquakes. And here's what the injection in each of these areas looks like through time. Um, so again, at the top one in Cherokee, we see um, very, very small volumes of, of either saltwater disposal or enhanced oil recovery, and then significant increases in the last several years um, that are followed by um, a large number of earthquakes in the last year and a half or so. 
We also see increases in the number of salt water, to, uh, in the volume injected by saltwater disposal wells in two other areas. That's the Perry area and the Jones areas here. And with varying temporal relationships, um, we see earthquakes happening in each of these areas after the increase in saltwater disposal. So going back to our main map, we've seen the Cherry area, Cherokee area, the Perry area, and the Jones area. Now let's compare them to Enid, Oklahoma City, and Ardmore. So all, all six of these areas are the same, have the same area. In other words, they're all 5,000 square kilometers. Um, and you'll notice some differences in these plots here. Um, so the Enid area, I, I, now I, Enid and Oklahoma City are on the same vertical axis of, of volume. So as you can see, and given that they're the same area, we can directly compare these graphs to the previous ones. You can see there are significantly fewer earthquakes, and there's also um, much less saltwater disposal happening in each of these areas with, with effectively no recent increase. Another area is the Ardmore area, where I've had to change the vertical axis here to go up to 60 million barrels per month because there's so much enhanced oil recovery injection going on here. In this area, there is tons of, there's a large volume of enhanced oil recovery injection, but there is still a very small volume of saltwater disposal injection, and there are still comparatively very few earthquakes in this area recently. <clears throat> so we've seen Cherokee, Perry, and Jones with a lot of earthquakes. We've seen Enid, Oklahoma City, and Ardmore with less saltwater disposal and fewer earthquakes. Now let's focus on two special study areas. I want to show you one well right near the town of Stillwater and the Prague area where we had the magnitude 5.7 earthquake. And now we're zooming in into much smaller areas. And starting with, with Stillwater, we have this one well here, um, that, that diamond shape. Uh, you know, I've made that well diamond shape because it essentially turned on and ramped up its volume over, over a period of six or eight months so that it was in going from near zero to about half a million barrels per month in that one well. When that happened, um, there are a number of small, so magnitude two and a half to three and a half earthquakes happening within several kilometers of the well. Uh, these cases, um, you can find these cases in the state of Oklahoma. Um, they are somewhat, so somewhat surprisingly rare. There are also other, another illustrative case is the Prague area, where we had the magnitude 5.7 earthquake. That's this dot right here. Um, there were two magnitude 5 events accompanying it, one one day before, another two days after. And you can see all of the aftershocks line up along this line, which is that fault slipping at depth. In this area, we do see saltwater disposal wells operating, but we don't see ramp, ramped up increases in their volume um, around the onset of seismicity. So that, does not, that neither proves nor disproves that these earthquakes were triggered, but it, um, t with, the amount, with the amount of data we have now, it's a case where we may, may never know the answer. So we can talk about these earthquakes happening through time. We can talk about wells nearby and, and, and salt water disposal volumes and whatnot. And here's a question we got a lot. So is this water coming from hydraulic fracturing? And here's my answer to that question. What I've done here is instead of monthly volumes, I've plotted yearly injection volumes for those three areas, Cherokee, Perry, and Jones, that had lots of earthquakes in them. And in each of those areas, um, what I've shown is, you know, in brown is the, is the volume injected in saltwater disposal wells. In black next to it is the volume injected in enhanced oil recovery wells. And then the little bit in green here, what that is, is when you hydraulically fracture a well, you might, like I said, you'll use a number of millions of gallons of water. And somewhere between 10 and 30% of that water will flow back to the surface. In the drier states, it's, it's recycled into the next frac job. In Oklahoma and a number of other states, it can be disposed of in a saltwater disposal well because that's cheaper than recycling it into the next frac job. So that our, our most generous 
aggressive upper bound estimate of the total volume of hydraulic fracturing flowback water that could have been disposed in each of these areas in each of these years is shown in green. So what you see here is in no area except for Perry in 2010 does it account for more than 10% of the volume injected in these wells. Um, so what that means is the water being injected is produced water. In other words, it was water that was sitting in the ground naturally with the oil or gas at, and produced with it, not part of the hydraulic fracturing process. Another point I want to make is that we need to worry about, um, make, about the hazard from triggering earthquakes, but to get big earthquakes, you need big faults. So what we've shown here is um, uh, Randy made this plot um, with a typical scaling. We have earthquake magnitude on this axis. And on this axis, we have the size of the fault patch that would need to slip. And so to get a, big, a relatively big earthquake, so if you want to make a magnitude 5 or a magnitude 6 earthquake, what that means is you need a fault patch that's at least several kilometers in length and maybe 20 or 30 kilometers in length. Um, there's, you know, there's some natural variation in there. Um, so what that tells us is to get earthquakes that big, you need faults that big, and so they have to extend into the basement. Um, so the basement in Oklahoma, the reason we can know that is, is about three kilometers. What that means is we have shallow sediments up here. The Ar Arbuckle is the, is the lowest sedimentary layer, and then below it we have igneous basement rocks. Um, you can see a histogram here of, of depths of earthquakes in Oklahoma, and you can see that the lion's share of the earthquakes are between about five and six kilometers deep um, and, and comfortably within the basement. Um, so that means going forward, if we're going to solve this problem, we need to, we need to not be pressurizing the, the faults that are in the basement. So is there a possible solution? Is there a way we can do that? Um, what, what we've told the um, companies that we've talked to is we think they should inject into the shallower formations that they're producing oil and gas from and create a cyclical flow process rather than injecting into the, the basal formations that are, that are on top of or hydraulically close to, to the basement where, where you need fault slip to make big earthquakes. And so in summary, these earthquakes are happening because we're pressurizing faults in the basement. Um, the water is produced water, not hydraulic fracturing flowback water. Um, it may, there may be a technical solution in the case of Oklahoma. We don't yet know at this point. Um, and, and that technical solution would be injecting into shallower formations, or at least that's what we've suggested. Um, I, I want to again emphasize that most of these, most saltwater disposal wells are completely safe, but there are some wells that have been associated with these earthquakes. So the question is, from going forward, how do we do the, the analysis? If we're not going to completely ban all saltwater disposal wells, we, there should be some framework with which we can make. Um, do the calculations to understand what risk we're comfortable taking and what risk we're not comfortable taking when we're talking about injecting fluid into the subsurface. And with that, Randy Walters is going to take over from here and tell you about a framework that she's developed to do exactly that. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so now that Rawl has really done a great job of framing this situation and the problem involved, what I want to do is offer a framework for how we can get around this problem. So instead of just going out there and continuing injecting fluids into the ground as we have been or some states have been for the past several years, there are particular things that we can offer as suggestions to limit these earthquakes. So fluid injection has the potential to trigger earthquakes. And as I mentioned, Rawl just spent the last 20 minutes describing this phenomenon to you. It's really quite fascinating that people have the ability to cause earthquakes. But what does this mean for earthquake risk? How do we need to incorporate this information in limiting and managing the risk associated with these earthquakes? 
So to step back, I want to describe to you how earthquake risk is analyzed in a natural sense. So of course, we have natural earthquakes occurring fairly frequently in California, all over the world. We're pretty familiar with this. The way that earthquake risk is analyzed here is by taking the earthquake hazard, which is the probability of a specific level of ground shaking occurring in an area, and combining it with the vulnerability of that area. So that includes especially the population density or the total population in the area. Um, so basically, vulnerability is the exposed population or structures, and I'll get into this in more detail, as well as how well that population can recover from some amount of damage. So as I mentioned, earthquake hazard is something that we have a fairly good understanding of, though many researchers are still working on this. Specifically, the United States Geological Survey, or the USGS, comes out with these earthquake hazard maps for the entire US. And from this information, um, they, can, they can give you an idea of where you might expect the <coughs> highest level of ground shaking to occur most frequently. And then the vulnerability, as I mentioned, is um, specifically dependent on the population density. So using this information, we can move forward in trying to understand triggered earthquake risk. And the important factor here that is unique from natural earthquake risk is the anthropogenic influence that we have. So things like injecting into the subsurface, the volumes and pressures, the actual geology, and again, I'll get into more details here. So what we've done is created a framework that oil and, gas oil and gas companies as well as oil and gas regulators can use in order to move forward to limit these events. And what we've done is we've created a document that's publicly available. You can access it online from the Stanford Center of Induced and Triggered Seismicity website. Um, if you just visit our website, it's pretty straightforward to find the link. It's about an 80-page document. We've also submitted a shortened version that covers just the risk assessment portion of this document to seismological research letters. But what the, what the document really contains is the first half of it looks at site characterization. So what do we need to know about the actual area in order to determine what the, what the hazard is? In addition to different ideas for monitoring and reporting, so when you do, um, so current issues with, with, this, with this situation is that often regulations do not require oil and gas companies to submit data in a timely fashion. There could be about a year lag or sometimes even more. This is a problem because it makes it difficult to assess whether or not earthquakes are occurring from um, injection. And so we, we offer suggestions on to do that in a more timely fashion, as well as suggestions for earthquake monitoring reporting. And then the last section of this goes over seismic hazard and risk assessment. This is this framework that we're presenting. And today I'm going to focus on that framework. So here is our risk assessment workflow. I don't want you to try to digest this all right now. We're going to revisit it throughout my talk. I'm going to go through each section explicitly one by one um, so we can work through it together. And hopefully by the end, I can convince you that there are many different things that we can do in order to limit this earthquake risk. So to begin, I want to focus on this top part here. This is the natural hazard, operational factors, exposure, and what we call the risk tolerance. So the, the necessary factors that need to be considered, like I mentioned, are the natural hazard, so that's the probability of shaking in a particular area, the exposure, so things like the population and population density, as well as the unique problem here, which is the operational factors. Uh, and this is the anthropogenic contribution to this problem. So to delve deeply into natural hazard, we want to understand the geologic setting. So what are the, what are the actual formations, the order of formations? As Raul was talking about, do we have a um, do we have particular formations in, in risky areas? As well as the earthquake history, so what is, the, what is our understanding of the earthquakes that have happened in the past? Hydraulic properties, so do we expect pore pressure changes to migrate extensively? Do we expect the pore pressure changes to stay in a particular area? As well as the geomechanical state, so what's the state of stress? What fault orientations do we expect to be potentially triggered? And then the operational factors, specific formation characteristics, um, injection operations, so what types of injection do we expect, different pressures, rates, and volumes, as well as the operating experience. Has there been injection in the area before? Do we, are you going into a particular area where um, perhaps no one has ever injected before and we don't know exactly how that, that particular um, part of the earth might respond to pressure perturbations? 
What are the effects of cumulative injection and are they a concern? So do we have a lot of faults injecting in, into one particular area? Um, will the, the total cumulative injection from all of those wells gonna cause a problem? As well as have earthquakes been triggered in that area before? And then to consider the exposure, specific populations, critical facilities such as hospitals, schools, uh, police stations, structures and infrastructure, so what are the characteristics of nearby buildings, roads, roads and bridges? Are they um, engineered to a particular earthquake safety standard or have they really not been um, built to a particular standard of, of shaking, as well as the environment? So we take all of these necessary factors, the natural hazard, operational factors, as well as the exposure, and then we combine those and think about what is our tolerance for risk? And what do I mean by risk tolerance? Well, every community regulating body in oil and gas company has its own acceptable standard for ground shaking caused by operations. And it's important to identify that before injection begins and before the risk assessment or a risk mitigation strategy begins. So I just want to, I want to stop really quick and have you all think, and you don't have to raise your hands or anything, but what is the amount of ground shaking that you would be willing to tolerate in order to have successful oil and gas exploration in the US. We all depend on oil and gas. It's part of our economy. It's part of how we function. So how much ground shaking would you be willing to put up with in order to have that be a successful part of our economy? Maybe it's $100, maybe it's $10,000, maybe it's not even money. It doesn't really matter, but just think about how, how much you would be willing to put up with it as we go through these next slides. So now we're back to the workflow. So we've gone through and looked at the different factors that are important, and we're gonna bring it into what we call a risk tolerance matrix. The x-axis of the risk tolerance matrix considers the operational factors from low to high. So what is the influence of those operational factors on the overall hazard in the area? On the y-axis, we have natural hazard going from low to high as well. The way we like to think about the natural hazard in this sense is, again, the probability of ground shaking in an area so the numbers that I have shown here on the y-axis, these are the modified mortality intensity scale, and what that means is the actual felt ground shaking at a particular site. So um, are your dishes rattling? Do, do building damage start to occur? Those, that's what's meant by this, um, this intensity scale here on the y-axis. So down here at the bottom, Earthquakes may not be felt, or they may only be felt by particular people in very ideal situations, perhaps if you're sitting down like we are here. Or up on the, the upper end here, the earthquake would be felt by all. Some might be frightened and small damage may begin to occur. So what do the colors mean? What the colors mean are the level of acceptability based on the tolerance for risk in the actual area. And when you're determining this, you want to think about the tolerance that not only the oil and gas operators and the regulator, regulators have, but of course the, the public as well. So if you find that your project has you know, maybe lower operational factors and low expected hazard, you would find yourself in the green area where green is safe and you would expect that the um, operations would continue as normal. If you find your project in the amber section of this risk tolerance matrix, what it means is that you might want to be cautious or you may need to adjust operational factors in order to bring a project, which perhaps sits here, over into a green area. And if you find your project lands in the red section, perhaps the natural hazard is just too high, then you may just want to consider a different site. There are going to be areas where it's not smart to inject based on this risk tolerance matrix. Or you can severely alter your injections depending on how these these colors here um, plot out. And what's important to remember is that this scale from green to red that I have here is slightly arbitrary. It's just me sitting you know, in my office talking with Mark about how we think this might look. But each individual site and each individual state needs to think about it in a site-specific manner. So perhaps the entire color spectrum could be shifted down to the left. Perhaps it could be shifted up higher. It all depends on the tolerance that you have. So here's an example of a place that might have a higher tolerance for risk. So you're willing to feel more ground shaking um, in this particular area, the area that this risk tolerance matrix represents. But in some cases, as I mentioned, you might have a lower tolerance for risk. And that means that you have a larger red region. Perhaps for the most part, the people just don't have a lot of tolerance for ground shaking. 
And these are the types of things that need to be thought about on a site-specific basis. So again, we get back to our workflow. So now we've gone through all of the different components that go that need to be considered prior to injection, and in some cases need to be considered throughout injection as well, depending on what, what information we learn as we go. But during injection is where the actual risk mitigation comes into play. What we suggest is a traffic light system, what's called a traffic light system. So as you can see from our risk tolerance matrix, you have red, amber, and green, much like a traffic light system, one that you see when you're driving. So you drive up to, a, to your, uh, through an intersection, your traffic light turns red, you need to stop, <coughs> right? We all know that. Well, California sometimes gets a little shaky, but um, if you're driving and you come up to uh, a traffic light and it turns amber, it means maybe you want to slow down, be cautious. You probably want to adjust your driving depending on you know, the, how amber it has been. And then if your, your traffic light is green, green means go, just continue operating within your traffic laws, or in the case of triggered and induced seismicity in oil and gas operations, within the regulations that are set upon you prior to injection. So how do we implement this traffic light system for triggered and induced seismicity or oil and gas operations? There are different observations that you will experience um, through data collection or um, general experiences from the public that are going to bring you from green to amber to red, depending on those observations. So not all projects will move between these different regions, and you want to you want to use one of these traffic lights for every project. But something that might get you from the green means go section into the amber cautious section are if you start to experience or record triggered and induced events. Those could be very small events, or they could be a little bit larger. It really depends. Historically, these traffic light systems, the thresholds that bring you from green to amber to red, are dependent on earthquake magnitudes or, or, or particular ground motions that are recorded. Something that's unique about the traffic light system that we are offering here as a part of this framework is that you not only use those, those particular observations, but also geologic observations. So do you start to see small events migrating further from your injection well than you expected them to, perhaps suggesting there's a permeable pathway or a fault, an active fault? Or do you see your events migrating into the basement? Those types of observations might move you from green to red or amber to red. And in those cases, you need to adjust your operations. So you're going to want to limit injection, um, perhaps limit volumes and rates. And you also want to increase your monitoring. In instances where the traffic light system turns red for a particular project, you don't, and if, if you choose, if it's part of the, the predetermined mitigation plan to stop injection if you reach this red section, you want to consider recording events even after injection has stopped. You don't want to just stop all of your data recording. And the reason for that is we can learn a lot from the subsurface and learn a lot from the risk in the area from events as we, we experience them even after injection. So what if we gain more data or events occur while we're injecting? Well, the whole purpose of this framework, and one of the unique parts of it, is that we're not just looking at the management of these earthquakes um, and the assessment of risk prior to injection and then letting injection go and using a traffic light system. But what we want to do is continuously update this framework and go through this risk assessment process while we are attaining data. So as you start to perhaps learn more about the tolerance in the area, or perhaps as you start to record earthquakes or learn more about the geology or the active faults in the area, you want to cycle back through or reiterate to better understand how to mitigate that risk and how to, how to work with the tolerance of the risk in the area. So hopefully I've convinced you that in order to limit trigger earthquakes, much more can be done. We can gain more data. We can think about the exposure in the area. We can come up with this risk tolerance matrix in order to inform the traffic light system, and then from there manage it in a more proactive way than just using the earthquake magnitudes and intensities to um, determine whether or not we choose to continue injecting in a specific area or not. So the benefits of the risk assessment strategy that we are suggesting here, the framework that we are suggesting here, is that it's site adaptable, so it focuses on every particular injection well. It's proactive. 
it's tolerance-based rather than just using the same tolerance for the entire US that focuses on a particular site. And then it changes, it considers changes in risk as you go. Again, as I mentioned, the full content of this project is on the Stanford Center for Induced and Triggered Seismicity website. You're welcome to access it. Um, and from there, Roll and I are more than happy to answer questions. There we go. Thank you. Um, we'll take questions from the students first. If there are any. OK. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Um, just come up. What would the cost be of uh, taking a one of these injection wells and instead injecting into a different part of the subsurface. That's something that you looked at. That's a good question. The short answer is I don't know. Um, Could you repeat the question, please? Sorry, I asked what the cost would be of uh, stopping injection at a site that might be risky and instead injecting elsewhere. Um, and the short answer is I don't know. I, I guess one thing I do know is the um, these companies tend to be paying one or two dollars per barrel to dispose of the water, um, and we're talking about uh, tens, tens, or tens of millions of barrels per month being injected in these areas. So that gives you a sense of the uh, economic value of the of the water disposal. Um, in terms of the engineering cost of repurposing a well to to um, to uh, inject at a shallower depth, I, I couldn't speak to that, unfortunately. Are uh, P companies mainly handling the disposal, and how often are they to recommendations changing? Um, we talk to them a lot. Um, we meet with uh, a number of, of companies interested in oil and gas production in this area. Um, they're aware of our they're aware of our findings, and um, they. In many cases, it's smaller. Sometimes it's trucking companies. Sometimes it's E&P companies, um, but it's it's often it's not the 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 few biggest companies doing these uh, producing in these areas. Often it's it's smaller names that you're less likely to have heard of um, that are operating many of these wells. So you said that one potential solution was to inject into shallower geological layers. Yeah. And so my vague understanding of drilling is that drilling is expensive. So why would these guys be drilling into deeper layers when they could just inject something shallower and it would be cheaper and safer? Um, that's a good question. Uh, to, OK, sorry. So the question was, drilling is expensive. The, the safer layers to inject are shallower layers, so why are they injecting into the deeper formations like the Arbuckle to begin with? The answer is the, that the Arbuckle is very thick, it's very laterally extensive, and it's very porous and permeable. So to a, to a first order and for a long time, that seemed like a great place to inject. Um, the problem that's come forward is that while it has all of those great characteristics for injection, it's also right next to the basement, or it's not isolated from the basement hydraulically. Um, so going forward, it would certainly make sense that, you know, if it does prove viable to inject into these shallower formations, that they would that people wouldn't drill wouldn't bother drilling saltwater disposal wells deeper. Um, but that, you know, there are already seven thousand of these wells operating in the state of Oklahoma as we speak. So uh, I'm afraid I came in late. Did you mention the Rocky Mountain Arsenal? Um, I didn't, but that is that was one of the cases where we first where we first realized that that we could trigger earthquakes from from water from yeah. fluid disposal wells. That was a case where the well was injecting directly into the basement. Um, to put it in context, here, did you have a further question or? No, I just a comment that caused a great deal of difficulty. Uh, to the Defense Department, <clears throat> because at that time uh, there was a significant program to do seismic uh, measurements around the Earth to detect the Russian underground atomic bomb tests. And uh, when this occurred, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal problem occurred. The Defense Department of the United States got extremely excited. 
negatively excited because it caused a very serious, uh, had a serious impact on, on trying to listen to other parts of the earth. Okay. Yeah. In terms of risk analysis, you mentioned uh, you look at it from different perspectives, from the companies, from people's perspective. Uh, so the problem with risk analysis is it's not an absolute quantity. It's a range, right? And you have defined the ranges in different color section based on different values. But even within ranges, the ranges will differ if you take the absolute upper amount or lower amount. Does that change based on the perspective you're analyzing this? For companies or people, how do you account for that? For all the different risk yeah. tolerances you might encounter. So we don't have a definitive suggestion on how all of these things should be balanced. It's going to be up to the regulators and the oil and gas operators and the communities to determine how that should be done. Um, the purpose of our work was really to offer offer the framework in general, give them a starting point or something to think of, like, you know, all these different elements that they really could be thinking about in order to mitigate this. But I absolutely agree that coming up, you know, trying to balance all of these different tolerances, it's going to be absolutely tricky. I mean, even Mark and I sitting in his office talking about this stuff, we have different tolerances for risk. And I think it's absolutely a, a tricky situation and it's interesting to think about. Are, are these induced earthquakes uh, a mere um, reputational risk for oil and gas companies? Or, or are they actually losing money from these small earthquakes that they're causing? My understanding is that <coughs> for now, it is it is a little bit more of a moral and reputational issue for the oil and gas companies. But that's not always the case. I mean, the picture that we have here, I didn't explain this. I probably should have at the end of my talk. This is a chimney that crumbled as the result of an earthquake that happened in Oklahoma. And while it's not really clear who should be at fault here and who should be paying, it's it has the potential to fall on the oil and gas companies to pay for these items. And it's, um, you know, these, this is a concern of theirs. They don't want to be paying out lawsuits. And they do care. They don't want to be triggering earthquakes. Um, and there are existing lawsuits on, on these earthquakes. Um, so I wanted to ask about injecting in the shallow <clears throat> formations instead of the deeper formations. In doing so, would you increase the risk of groundwater contamination? Um, I in general, I would I would not think you would increase it significantly. The the primary um, the saltwater disposal wells are regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is does a very good job of what it's designed to do, which is protect drinking water. On the on the slide up there, I or on on, um, on one of these slides, I showed the approximate depths of drinking water relative to the depths of um, of the saltwater disposal wells in the hydraulic fracturing operations. Um, where is it? So here on this one, I've drawn in, the, you know, for relative comparison, these are the approximate depths where salt water, where drinking water wells are operating. And by shallower, Rawl was meaning back into the formations from which the water originally came, not not at very shallow depths. In the back. You focused a lot of the analysis on uh, like the flow effects um, versus like capacity effects. Was that largely because it's been found that? It, it, I mean, is there is there a reason for that? I would guess the capacity effects would have been maybe more important. Um, that's a good question, and and it, you know that's been an ongoing question as we've done this analysis. You know, are we are we filling up something, or are we, or is is it the fluid pressure and and Based on the modeling that we've seen and, and the other scientists we've talked to, it's a um, the the it's the issue is a pressure that is greatest at the the inject where the well is injecting and it's propagating outward um, based on increased volumes. So there's, in other words, what that suggests is there is some natural. Uh, there is some natural capacity of the hydrologic system to absorb a, a, a rate of rate of in, injection, and the issue comes when your injection exceeds that rate. Um, is how the system appears to behave from everything we know. Okay, one more question. Uh, I'm just curious. Have you been in touch with uh, any of the large reinsurers 
who would be looking at this from both the property and business interruption exposure to get you that risk tolerance perspective? We haven't talked specifically with insurance or reinsurance companies. It is a topic that comes up every now and then. Um, I really, honestly, I, I really don't know of a useful comment I can make. <laughs> well, you know, insurance is a way of managing risk. And um, to my knowledge, well, earthquake risk is managed uh, through uh, earthquake insurance, and those companies have, are reinsured. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, that's not yet been extended to induced seismicity, but it, it might be in the future. So it was in the New York Times. They are now starting to look at stipulating yeah. that. Laying that risk off. Okay, well, one final question. Does this have potential positive benefits from stress relief point of view? So, the energy that's released in earthquakes is an exponential energy re energy release. So, what it means is, for Mark, make sure I'm not going to say this wrong, but for every magnitude two earthquake a magnitude three has 32 times the amount of energy. So that would mean that to release the same amount of energy in a magnitude three, you need 32 magnitude two earthquakes. We are, so the types of earthquakes that are of most concern for damaging an area are very large magnitude, and you would need so many small magnitude events in order to compensate for the energy that would be expelled in a larger event that it's, it's not really on the same scale. So it's not like we can inject into faults to lubricate them and um, you know, expel some of that energy to hopefully avoid a larger event. It's, it's just not on the same scale to have that conversation. In fact, just to tie that question to the question about the Denver Arsenal, as soon as it was recognized in the late 1960s that the earthquakes were being turned on and off by fluid injection, that question has came up. But as Randy said, you tend to get 10 magnitude twos for every magnitude three, but you would need 32 magnitude twos in order to release the equivalent energy. So you really don't get rid of the energy in these small earthquakes. <clears throat> and the point that Roll made about the basement faults are really important because that Prague earthquake was a 5.7. Was it triggered? Maybe. Maybe not. But the, the demonstrate the potential for bigger earthquakes to occur in that region. And that's why there's so much concern about these threes and fours. The threes and fours themselves are not the problem. But the threes and fours are telling us is you're triggering slip on basement faults. And some of those faults could produce larger and more damaging earthquakes. And that's the problem we want to prevent. So let's stop there and thank Randy and Mullins.